So here we are again on another Sunday morning. Still going to be continuing through our series in Exodus, following the life of Moses. Obviously we're not gathered together, but we can come around the Word of God together. And um, at the end of the service there will be a hymn, although this week there's no words to, or someone accompanied singing. But there is music and the words are there so that you can sing them at home if you wish. It's amazing this modern technology, how people from all over the world can, can tap into things. I've got a friend in Africa where I, I did a few stints in Africa teaching pastors on the Sudan border between Kenya and Sudan. And one young man that we've kept in touch with over the years, a young man called Stephen, who works uh, amongst a tribe called the Taposa. Well, Stephen emailed me this week to say that he's been watching this on YouTube. So if you're watching, Stephen, God bless you. And it's good to, to be able to join with us today. But our reading this morning is found from Exodus <clears throat> and chapter 7 again. Exodus 7, verse 7 through to 18. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. And then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they did just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and be because before his servants and it became a serpent. But Moses also, Pharaoh, sorry, also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them, as the Lord said. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, and when he goes out to the water, you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are on the, in the river and with the rod and which is in my hand, and it shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink the water of the river. Amen. So that's the section we're going to be looking at, probably a little bit further in as well. If you have your Bibles, you can keep them open at Exodus chapter 7 and chapter 8. But really, our title this morning is A Battle Royal, A Battle Royal. We're thinking about a great contest this morning. We see that this great contest we're going to consider this morning is really between God and Satan, which we're going to consider. The first thing we're going to see is this, that God sees the big picture. God sees the big picture. Now, a turning point in Exodus was to begin when we saw last week in chapter 6, verse 10 and following. Mary, Moses had gone to the people and he told them that God was going to deliver them and they became very encouraged. But then when Pharaoh heard these things, he made their lives a lot harder. Then the people became discouraged and they rejected the message that, that Moses had brought to them. Also, when he goes to Pharaoh, well, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he rejected what he had to say. So Moses was called to be faithful to God's word. He was not called to know what the outcome was or how things were going to work out. And he reminded us by looking at the family tree that we thought about the genealogy that followed the, the line of Aaron and, and um, Moses, that God has all things covered. And for many years, God had a purpose behind what was happening. In fact, 400 years plus before these events, God had predicted what would take place. Now, we only get really a short vision or a short um, sighted view of what's happening in our lives. When we look at the world and we even look over history, we've only got a short view of what's taking place. It's a little bit like walking through a city. If we walk through a city, we only see the streets we're walking down, the people, the cars. 
It's not until we get to a high rise building that we're able to stop and get a panoramic view of the place. And then we see more of the city as it really is. Well, Moses, as it were, is still walking down the street. And we can say, well, we can look back now and we can see what God was doing and how things were to work out for the Israelites. But in the situation, Moses was just going down the street. He couldn't get an overview. God saw and sees the big picture. Now, we're in a situation at the moment in the midst of this pandemic, and we can't see the big picture. We don't really know what's going on, but I'm totally confident that God can. And I believe that God had a plan for Moses. I believe that God had a plan for Pharaoh and the children of Israel. And I believe that God has a plan for us. He even has a plan that can be worked out through this pandemic. God has his agendas. And God will have his name made known. In chapter 7, verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt. In chapter 8 and verse 10, that you may know that there is none no like the Lord our God. Chapter 9, verse 14, to Pharaoh, he says, for, the, for this time I will send my plagues on you yourself and upon your people so that you may know there is none like me in all the earth. So God knows and God sees the big picture. Why is Israel, why is Egypt going through these particular issues? Well, they didn't really understand what was taking place. Why does God allow situations that we get into and allow things to happen the way they do? Then we, we don't really know. But we believe that God is in control. We believe that he speaks. He speaks through creation, we said last week. We can see the evidence of God all around us. There's a song that says, In the stars is handy work, I see. And on the wind he speaks in majesty. He speaks to us in creation. He speaks in providences. That is the events that take place in the world and in our own lives. And it helps us to see that God has a purpose. And God had a purpose. He had a redemptive plan for the children of Israel. He was going to release them from captivity. He has a redemptive plan from the beginning of time for mankind. For well, mankind isn't in a slavery like Israel was in Egypt. But we are in a slavery which we would liken to sin. And really that's what prevents us from entering the kingdom of God. That's why Moses had to go and deliver the children of Israel from their slavery as, a, as their great saviour, as their deliverer. And that's why Jesus, God's son, came into this world to deliver us. John chapter 1 and verse 18 tells us, No one has seen God but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. Now Moses comes to make God known to Israel and to Pharaoh. God sent his son into this world that we may know him. John chapter 17 and verse 3 says this, This is eternal life, that you may know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Jesus came to make God known to us. So God sees the big picture from the very entrance of sin into this world at the beginning of time. That God would have to judge sin. That God would have to punish sin. He knew that from the beginning. And God would allow his son to take the punishment for our sin so that we could be delivered from the consequences of our sin. But God saw the big picture from the beginning when man fell in the garden to the time when Jesus would come and die on the cross. But that was thousands of years. The Bible says the wheels of God grind exceedingly slow. Uh, but God has a purpose. And we live in an age, we live in an age when everything's got to be instant. So we can text, we can put things out on the internet and they can be found at the other end of the world in, in seconds. God will be the victor. The big question is, are we on the victory side? Because God has got the big picture covered. He sees and he knows and he's in control of all. Then we see there is this battle royal. 
So we see next is a great contest. Now the issue seems to be, the contest seems to be between Moses and Pharaoh, between Israel and Egypt. But well, there's a bigger picture. If you were to read the last book of the Bible, chapter 11 of Revelation through to chapter 22, we find there that God is telling us the battle has been between himself and the evil one, Satan. The one true God against the fake gods of this world. The one true God of Moses against the fake gods of Egypt. And God had already given Moses a sign of his power in chapter 4. Remember, he'd shown him, throw the staff down, it'll become a snake. And it did. Now, he's told to go before the most powerful man in the world at that time, Pharaoh. And when he asks you for a sign, God says in verse 8 and 9 of chapter 7, what you need to do again is throw the staff down and the rod will become a serpent. And so it happened, as God said, to display his power with this amazing miracle. It became a serpent. Now, the serpent was an image of a goddess of Egypt. When you look at the pictures of the pharaohs, they have on their head this, this kind of circular thing like a crown. And there's a cobra very often or a serpent which is pointing up from it. It's to be that sort of symbol of their authority and their power. The God of Moses was challenging the so-called gods of Egypt and the so-called God that they thought was, was Pharaoh. And as Moses' rod comes and turns into a serpent, as he throws it down in front of Pharaoh, in verse 11, Pharaoh's not overly impressed. But what he does then in verse 12, he calls his magicians and his sorcerers. And his magicians throw down their rods and they turn into snakes. Now, how that happened, I can't tell you. Was it a, a, a trick? Was it some kind of um, devious thing that happened? Was it sort of snake charming that they could produce some kind of great effect? Or was it a manifestation of Satan and the, the, the fact that he has powers? And if you remember in the, in the Garden of Eden, he comes before Adam and Eve as a serpent and challenges God's authority. And so the battle royal here, you see, is between God and Satan, between Satan and God's people, between good and between evil. And the battle of the plagues would go on. It would go on, we're told, for something like three months plus. And yet Satan knew at the end the victory wasn't his. In Revelation, again, chapter 20 and verse 10, he knows he will be cast into a lake of fire and of brimstone at the end of time. He will be defeated in the end. But until that day, he's wreaking havoc in this world, a sin abounds on every hand. The depths of evil of mankind, the depths that man can stoop to is, is frightening, isn't it? And he is, Satan is the great deceiver. He comes and he wants to con the world into thinking that his ways are the best ways. When he knows ultimately he's restricted because he is a defeated foe. He seeks to win battles in our lives and in the lives of people in this world, but he knows that the war is lost. The snakes appear from the magicians before Aaron, Moses' serpent. However, what happened was Moses' serpent just ate and devoured all the other ones. They could produce some kind of imagery or however they did it, but they were not able to, to counter what God had done through Moses. Now, Satan seeks to have counterfeit things in this life. There are counterfeit religions, counterfeit Christianity to ultimately to seek to undermine the work of God. God sees the big picture. There is a great contest going on. And then we see that here's the picture of a hardened heart. Satan is stubborn. Satan, Satan, um, sorry, Pharaoh is stubborn and his heart is hardened. Verse 13, we find that Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he wouldn't take any notice. What could move hearts? Well, sometimes troubles, sometimes illness, wars, deaths pandemics or what have you, can soften hearts. 
perhaps many things can come as a warning in our lives that sometimes God would give us. And what if he did produce some miraculous event? Would that move the hearts of people who are here in our land at this time? Because the Bible describes the heart of man like a rock. Pharaoh was not going to change his mind, though God had revealed himself in his power. Pharaoh wanted to see a manifestation. And yet he's seen the manifestation and still his heart was hardened. And the great truth of the gospel is there is a miraculous work that God does through the Holy Spirit. And that work is this. He can take a hardened heart like Pharaoh's and he can make it a heart of flesh. He can soften us. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. When we read the New Testament, we find even as we go through church history, there have been some remarkable changes that have taken place in people's lives. Hardened hearts, the most unlikeliest characters in the Bible and in church history and people we've met who have been changed. They've been given a heart of flesh, been given a new heart. The Bible calls it and we call it a conversion takes place. A change is brought about by God. Now we talked much about in the last few weeks about Easter, about the crucifixion, about the resurrection, about the fact that Jesus came to conquer sin and death. And he rose again and he went back to his rightful place in heaven. But that wasn't the end of the story. Jesus said he would not leave his people without comfort. So on the day of Pentecost or Whitson, he promised he would send one to be their comforter and helper and guide. And that would be the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And he sent the Holy Spirit in all his fullness and power. And it's that spirit that changes the heart of people. Gives us a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. Paul could say, you see, that I live, but it's not me who lives. It's Christ by his spirit who lives in me. Christ who ascended on high, led captivity captive. And all principalities and powers he has put under his feet. Jesus defeated Satan. And he gives power to change people's lives. The battle royal, yes. It goes on still. But who is on the Lord's side? Pharaoh was met on the banks of the river Nile, verse 14, by these two old men, 80 and 83 years of age. They're going before the most powerful man on the planet at that time. They repeat God's message. They say, let my people go so that they can worship me until they are able to give God thanks for all that he's done. But Pharaoh was going to take no notice. Pharaoh, you're going to have to submit one day and bow your knee to God. And the Bible makes it very clear that unless our hearts change, we one day, each one of us, have got to bow the knee before Almighty God. The signs, well, they would confirm God's message. Oh, that we could see signs, people would say. If we could see miracles. Well, let me tell you, God's signs in the Bible were there to authenticate his message and scripture now has revealed all that we need to know more signs would not add to the validity of god's word we've well, got enough in god's word now to point us to him as being the god god was to liberate this people to worship him and that's the chief end of man is to worship god and it's part of our nature isn't it it's part of us that we really if we want to worship something or someone. Now, I'm old enough to say I was a teenager in the 60s. So I just came out of the 50s and the music of the era. Skiffle was Lonnie Donick and I used to sing to my kids, My Old Man's a Dustman and the Rock Island Line and what have you for a, for a bit of fun. Then it moved into the 60s and you had Elvis, you had Jerry Lee Lewis, you had Little Richard, rock and roll, which again, I have to confess, I like rock and roll. It then moved on to the Hollies, the Beach Boys, those sort of groups that came to the fore in the late 60s. What title were they given? They were given the title of Pop Idols. In my younger day, I would have been a supporter of Manchester United in the days of Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law and George Best. George Best was to become the first what? He was to become the first idol. 
in football that was almost worshipped by the people. The media, they milked the need for people to adore and worship something or someone. And you get into the 60s, you've got the, the Beatles being mobbed by thousands and thousands of followers. Today, social media is able to present things that people can become so captivated by. And football crowds gather in their thousands each Saturday to go and to, to bring, as it were, themselves before their, their great idols, the, the football. Now, I love football, I, I love rugby. But these things have been taken from us at the moment in society, haven't they? And we see so somehow that they weren't really that important in our lives. I mean, Coronation Street, EastEnders, they may not be able to put any more live programs on in a few weeks. I never watch it, thankfully. But if you're caught, what are you going to do if there's no Coronation Street? For many, it's been their lives. They just can't wait for whatever night that comes on. Can't wait for Saturday to go and see the teams. You see, God made us to worship. But all that he would cause us to worship him. When we're delivered from this pandemic, I wonder whether we've been weaned off much then that we've taken and been taken up by over these last years. And the void that people's lives have been left with because of the pandemic. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if they seek God? And they, the first Monday, Sunday we go back to church, the crowds are gathering because they want to come and worship God. God wanted three million people to go into the desert to worship him. Verse 17, now the plagues were to begin again. They were to go and reveal their power to, to Pharaoh. They were to go down to the Nile. Now the Nile was the very essence of their existence. And this plague against the Nile would be that which would hit Egypt sideways. The life of Egypt was going to be suddenly affected. Is it not a, a amazing how suddenly when something's removed, how society gets knocked sideways? The Egyptians worshipped the Nile. They thought of it as almost like a god. And so God was to prove to Israel, he was to prove to Egypt by these plagues that he is in control. The Lord says, you will know I am the Lord. The great miracle was performed with the staff. Moses strikes the Nile. Verse 18 is changed into blood and all the fish would die and the river would stink and they would not be able to drink from it. This was to be the first of those 10 plagues. All the nations around would come to hear of God's power. Psalm 78 would tell us about that. Verses 18 and 19. It was an ecological disaster. It would last probably for about seven days. The country was in turmoil. The river Nile has become blood. The magicians again could produce something similar on a smaller scale, but they couldn't prevent the, what was taking place. To see what God would do, this would surely soften the heart of the leader. His people are panicking, they're digging holes everywhere trying to find fresh water. And then we find what does Pharaoh do? This great leader goes back to his palace. We've been told recently that King John. John Un from North Korea, they thought he was dead. He wasn't dead. He was in this remarkable palace which he's had built, this place that he's had built, which is bomb-proof. Um, bomb it's a remarkable place. And he's, like Pharaoh, goes back to his place. He says, well, whatever's going on in North Korea, and they tell us there's a lot of salvation there. Whether that is the fact, I'm not sure, but they tell us there's some terrible things going on there. Kim Jong-un would say, but I'm all right, Jack. Pharaoh would say, I'm okay. When we think of North Korea, it shows us how the, the communist ideals really come to the fore. They, they, they want equality for the people. But as ever, at the top, there's one who is worshipped by the people, but he's self-centered. If you want to see miracles in the hope that people will believe, well, just look at Pharaoh. God spoke through Moses, gave miracles, and he didn't listen. 
God shows the great power that can change their status in a moment. He shows he is all power, powerful. He shows that he can highlight the emptiness of people's lives who worship things which are of little worth and hope and meaning find, not found in them. You see, when we do not believe in God, the alternative is not believing in nothing. It's almost believing in anything, trying to fill that void which we were made for. We have to ask, what is our hope and our trust in? Two options, bow the knee and accept Jesus Christ as Saviour, or one day he will be our judge. The blood spoke of God's judgment, and eventually it would lead to deliverance. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And when we go through the Old Testament, all the way through the Old Testament, there was blood that was being shed, but it was the blood of animals, which would point to that final sacrifice where Jesus Christ would die, shed his blood, and he would take the judgment for sin, which was ours. The animals were to be a substitutionary offering, and by seeking forgiveness through their shed blood, there was forgiveness. Now in Jesus Christ, we have the final offering. He shed his blood as that substitutionary offering to take punishment for sin, but also the blood speaks of his love and his mercy and his grace that is freely given to those who will trust in him. How much patience God has shown with us, with our nation, with our world. He's given us so many opportunities to heed his message. He knows the beginning from the end. Satan, who's involved in this great battle, knows his end. This is a battle royal. But God sees the big picture. It's a great contest, but God is the victor. Unfortunately, even with the miraculous things that take place, Pharaoh hardens his heart. This morning, are we on the Lord's side? Are we trusting in him and ask him to give us a heart which is softened to be able to worship him in a way which we were made for? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you again that you're the God who creates, the God who sustains, and the God who provides for all that we need in this world. We thank you for your mercy and your grace made known in your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're amazed at your love that you sent him into a world to take the punishment which was ours by right, so that we could be cleansed. We thank you that he shed his blood so that we could know what it is to be washed clean and given a new heart. Pray that we will be on the Lord's side and all these things that are happening around us we pray that it'll help us to see and to be able to put things in perspective and to realize that we were made to worship but not particular people or teams or situations but to worship you we ask this in the name of your son and our savior the Lord Jesus Christ amen now we're gonna we're gonna try and, and sing a hymn uh, at the end of this service this morning and unfortunately, um, I haven't got the, the singing, but I have got the words and the music that will come up. So if you listen to the music, read the words because they're relevant to what we've been saying. And if you've got a voice, then feel free to join in with the music.